very special day for me. So thank you, Bev. Um, I'm bringing your dynamic dunescape uh, project to us. Uh, you only started in March, I know, so, and it's not been easy since then, has it? We None of us have an easy time since then. But I think it's fantastic. We were hoping to invite you to speak in the spring because we thought that would be appropriate. You'd have had time to get used to everything and the chance to go on the boroughs would be right ahead of us. Aww. But instead you rescued us from a difficult situation because as, as everybody I think will know, Professor Hawkins couldn't come because he chose to move house today. <laughs> So thank you for that rescue, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, the reason why the dunes are so important to me is that 20 years ago, Rob and I moved to North Devon and almost immediately I got involved in the, what at the time we thought of as the Braunton Burroughs Biosphere Project to try and get renewed status recognition from UNESCO under their, then it was called the Man and Biosphere Project. Oh. I don't think we could call it anymore, could we? <laughs> But it was trying to broaden the interest in, in what was a phenomenally biodiverse and exciting dynamic mm -hmm. dune system into, and bring it into the community and relate it to the community. And I was totally wedded to that. And that was fantastic. But I must admit, I've drifted away from it a bit since then, lured by the sea. Um, but with the lockdown, I and several others, including once with Alicia, have been going into the boroughs rather more and it was a wonderful time to go, just the best. Uh, and I also saw quite a few people working on assessing the biodiversity and actually doing some physical management. And so I'm longing to hear more about that. It reminded me that when I first started on the project, I was trying to assess how important the biosphere was and the boroughs was as the biosphere as we then conceived it. And I got hold of a name of somebody called Professor Arthur Willis, who wrote the book on dune ecology. He was, I think, over 80 by the time I got hold of his name. And I just rang up his last university and said, where can I find him? They said, oh, he'll be in the lab. So I got to speak to him in the lab and he was, and we chatted. He'd been at Bristol University, where you were, where my father was. And indeed, he was an old friend of my dad's. Amazing circularity. So he then gave me some support, said Braunton Burroughs was one of the best dunes gate systems in the country, possibly the world. Well, that was a great claim. I was really thrilled, mainly because it was convenient for Bristol, more convenient than most major dunescape systems were for Bristol. But that takes me back to introducing Bev about time too. She did her degree at Bristol University um, in wildlife conservation largely spent at Bristol Zoo, great. Uh, and she says she has a, her favorite habitat is coastal habitat. So that, that links her to us and it links us to dunes and coastwise. She worked with the RSPB. She's done ecological surveying and marine project work. She's been here with us for since March on a three year project covering sites in England and Wales. And her work is supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the EU Life Programme. And she works with partners so numerous that if I was to tell you, you'd say, shut up, Paula, let's hear from Bev. So let's hear from Bev and thank her very much for coming to talk to us. Thank you, oh, Bev. Thank you, Paula. What a lovely introduction. OK, yeah, so I'm here from the Dynamic Dunescapes Project. Um, this is a very ambitious project. Uh, as Paula said, it is funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and EU Life. And the reason is, is it's here to restore some of the sand dune systems that we have in the UK and Wales. And this is for the benefit of wildlife, also for people and communities that live and rely on the sand dune systems. So we are targeting some of the most important sand dune systems in England and Wales. So if you look, look at this map here, it shows the um, areas and locations that we're actually going to be working across in England and Wales. So there's 34 sites that are going to benefit from the project. Now the work at each site is led by one or two of the project partners. Um, so um, in North Devon, we're mainly going to be working at Braunton Burrows and Wollacoon Sand Dunes as well. 
But also you mentioned Croyd. So we have been talking with a lady called Holly Robertson and she is the beach manager for Park Dean Resorts at Croyd. And she also looks after the sand dune system there and she's really keen to get involved with the project. So we are hoping to incorporate Croyd into the project as well. So that's brilliant news. And um, so yeah, you can see that we are working over quite a vast area in the UK and Wales. So if we start with Lincolnshire, um, this is led by Natural England and the Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust. And then if we move south to Dorset, this is at Studland in Dorset. It's a beautiful sand dune system. And the work there is going to be led by the National Trust. <clears throat> and then if we move across to Cornwall, the work on the Cornish coast is going to be led by the Cornish Wildlife Trust. And then here in North Devon, the work is being led by Plant Life in conjunction with the National Trust. So I sit within the National Trust. And then over in Wales, there are various locations across Wales. And the work there is led by National Resources Wales, Plant Life and the National Trust. Then we move up to the Sefton Coast and that's led by Natural England and the National Trust. And then all the way up to the Cumbrian Coast. And this is led by Natural England, also working with the Cumbria Wildlife Trust and the National Trust. But there's also more project partners as well. So the MOD are involved, the Environment Agency, local councils, even some golf clubs, and here in Devon, Christie's Estate, who own Lawns and Burrows. So you can see it's quite complex with a lot of people involved in delivering this project. <clears throat> so why? Why focus on sand dune systems? So what we know our dunes are sanctuaries to many, many rare species, as well as an abundance of lots of different species. <clears throat> and we know that for dunes to be healthy and to support the diverse wildlife that we have on sand dunes, they actually need to be free to move and be dynamic. We also know that we need healthy sheltered dune slacks, which you can see in the bottom picture there. So we need water sources within the sand dune systems. We also know that we do need areas of low vegetation. But we also know that we haven't been managing the dunes very well. So our understanding of dune management has changed. So historically, what we actually did was we put up fences and we told people to stay out. And what that has done as it's, it's led and contributed to overgrowth of vegetation. And this has caused the genes to become stabilized. So they become overgrown with vegetation and scrub. They're far too stable. There isn't enough fair sand for dune wildlife to thrive. So their natural dynamic processes have become completely impeded by this. And unfortunately, dunes have declined dramatically over the last 120 years. OK, so they are now listed as the most at risk habitat in Europe. So that's pretty frightening. They also are suffering from lots of invasive species as well. And um, so unfortunately, a lot of sand dunes are not in a healthy state. But why does this matter? <clears throat> so I'm going to focus a little bit on this slide about the wildlife. So as I have mentioned, dunes are actually sanctuaries to many, many rare species, like the sand lizards, which you can see on the bottom right there, the natterjack toad as well, and it's home to hundreds and hundreds of more common species and plants, such as orchids, the bee orchid you can see pictured here, and butterflies. <clears throat> but a lot of these species are specifically adapted for life in healthy sand dune environments. So we do know that a healthy sand dune is a haven for lots of wildlife. The open areas of bare sand, they are essential. They're essential for 
masking, foraging, hibernating, and a breeding site for species such as the northern dune tiger beetle. Lots of solitary bees and solitary wasps rely on this open bare sand. And as I've already mentioned as well, sand lizard. These are extremely rare. And they're extremely rare because they've lost their habitat. They rely on sand dunes and dune heaths as well, which is another very rare habitat associated with some sand dune systems. And they're very, very restricted now to just a few isolated areas. So I mentioned Studland and Dorset. You can find sand lizards there. Uh, some places in Hampshire and Surrey. But what the sand lizards do is they dig burrows out of the sandy soil and they dig them for shelter and also for hibernation. So they require mature sunny habitats, but also this open undisturbed sand to lay their eggs. So reintroduction programmes have helped actually establish new populations of sand lizards in the UK and Wales. And we're actually looking at um, the viability of introducing sand lizards to Wollacoon sand dunes. So they are at Thornton Burrows. I haven't seen one at Thornton Burrows, uh, but they are there. And we are looking at whether we could viably have a healthy population at Wollacoon sand dunes. So we're looking into that as part of the project at the moment. So that's pretty exciting. Another species that has been enormously affected by um, the damage done to sand dunes is this. One of my favourites, actually, the small blue butterfly. So very much a species associated with sand dune systems and coastal regions as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is our smallest resident butterfly. Um, I think often it's overlooked, actually, because Although it's called the small blue butterfly, it's actually a bit dusky in colour. Um, it's absolutely tiny, this lovely little butterfly. Um, and it's uh, confined to very, very small isolated patches where you find its plant, the kidney vetch. So the small blue butterfly is completely reliant on kidney vetch in all stages of its life cycle. Um, and you can find small blue butterflies sort of from late afternoon onwards. They do this really interesting thing that you can see pictured here, where they kind of come together in sort of communal roosts um, and they shelter together and they put their heads down. And you can find them with their heads down near long grass and open areas near long grass. So it's really beautiful when you see it. Um, but okay, these are these are only in a few isolated areas in Britain, and they are declining in those areas. Um, we also know that they won't disperse very far, so connectivity between healthy sites is very very important for this species. So again, we have a research student that is actually looking into the plausibility and viability of trying to encourage the small blue butterfly onto the sand dune systems in North Devon. So the last recorded small blue butterfly on Thornton Burrows was 2018. So it hasn't been seen or recorded since, and it's never been seen or recorded at Wollacoon sand dunes or Croyd sand dunes. However, Croyd, there, are, there is kidney vetch growing at Croyd. So we are looking at whether we can change or improve management to <clears throat> encourage kidney vetch and then in turn the small blue butterfly but also work with other organizations to improve the connectivity between these sites to try and encourage this very rare butterfly back to North Devon. So that's another exciting research project that um, dynamic genescapes are looking into in North Devon. But why are sand dunes important in other ways? Well, for those that live on the coast, we've probably experienced this all too well. Dunes actually protect us. So they, they're a very, very powerful antidote against 
beach and coastal erosion. They play a huge role in coastal protection because they actually slow and stop erosion. So when sand is deposited in the dunes faster than it could be washed away from the beach, they therefore build up higher and wider and they will shelter inland habitats from the sea and they will move around accordingly. So they help naturally protect inland habitat. So from coastal flooding, from huge storms, and also the sand that's deposited on the sand dunes can actually be a source of sand to help maintain the beach in the future as well. So they actually in turn help create healthy beaches. And of course, dunes have a history. And actually this is something that I'm becoming more and more engaged with and interested in is the importance that lots of sand dune systems played um, in World War II. So they were, especially in North Devon, so Braunton Burrows and Woolacoon sand dunes were enormously important for tr as training sites for the Normandy D-Day landing. So every uh, bit of the sand dunes were covered with um, uh, these relic boxes, these pill boxes with soldiers, with wire, with training happening. Um, so they, these DJ landings, they were very, very ambitious exercise rehearsals to prepare them for the Normandy D-Day landings. And this is because uh, the beaches here and the sand dune systems here actually replicated the beaches in Normandy where they were going to be landing. So really, really important. And you can still see relics at Woolacoon Sand Dunes and Braunton Burrows. So the picture here, oh, I actually took this one. Um, I thought it was of a pillbox, but someone actually said that it, it wasn't. I, I think it was more of a shelter apparently, but it gets uncovered and then recovered at Woolacoon all the time. So very interesting. Um, so I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about how dunes are formed and why this is actually important. Uh, so I'm going to look at this dune formation and what we call this is the successional stages. So this helps us to understand a little bit more about the stabilisation process and why over stabilisation at certain parts of this successional stage is actually very bad. Uh, so typically there are seven stages to a dune life cycle. The youngest part, if I've got my little <laughs> here. So this will form very, very close to the beach. And this is the youngest part. So this will be the youngest part here of the sand dune system. <clears throat> so what actually happens is waves, they will come and they will push sand up onto the beach. And this sand is picked up and it's blown by the wind. But when this sand hits obstacles, so debris, often on the strand line, you'll find lots of debris, the sand starts to get trapped. And as it gets trapped, it accumulates and starts to build up. So it starts to form dunes. Um, and then what you can see then, and that's how the sand dune starts to build. So this is, just that diagram but in picture form so for those people a bit more familiar with with going to sand dunes this might this might be familiar to you so these are the different successional stages and I'll go and talk about each one in more detail now so first off you get these embryo or mobile four dunes so they are the youngest sand dunes they face the beach. These are the dunes that face the beach. So if, you, if you're standing on the beach and you turn around, these are typically the dunes that you're going to see. And they're made up mostly of lots of exposed sand. They also tend to be the smallest of the sand dune stages, and normally just a few metres tall. And it's here that you'll start seeing these pioneer species, we call them, such as marram grass. So uh, this is marram grass. 
and this grass starts to colonize the sand here and begins to put down their long roots and this then starts to stabilize part of the sand dune. Now in this uh, in these embryo dunes, in these mobile four dunes, this is where you'll find species such as sea holly. Um, we also, that will also start to colonise here. Uh, but because of the abundance <clears throat> of all this bare sand, it's very, very important for rare species. So lots of rare species will thrive in these embryo and mobile dunes. Then if you start moving back, you start getting to these semi-fixed genes, also known as yellow genes. You might hear them referred to as yellow genes, and this is because of the colour of the sand here. So plant roots are now starting to reach deeper and deeper into the genes. So you will get this here. And these genes are moderately stable now. So there's still vast amounts of exposed sand, you can see, and this sand is able to move around. So it can provide sand to the genes further back, or it can provide sands for the embryo genes as well. So the sand will continue to accrete here, um, and as I said, can be blown over the ridges to the genes behind them or in front of them. So as we then move back, we get what we call these fixed dunes and also these dune slacks, these ponds on areas of water. So we're now moving typically quite far away from the beach now. And these dunes become a lot less yellow in colour and they begin to turn a little bit grey. And this is because because these dunes now support diverse plant life and the plant bacteria starts to break down into this organic plant matter um, which actually can turn the colour of the dunes a little bit grey. These dunes are also good at holding water so they are able to support a huge diversity of plant life. So this picture on the left, you can see the fixed dunes with the dune slacks. And then you can also, so these dune slacks are where these sort of damp depressions form. And if they are low enough to meet the water table, then they'll start to create lots of water. And these then in turn are home to lots of specialized species. So the rare natterjack toad relies on these dune slacks. Amphibians, invertebrates, birds, dragonflies, a whole round of different species are reliant on these dune slacks to thrive. Um, and the nutrient enriched soils that we get here are home to many, many orchid species, including the bee orchid that I pictured earlier. <clears throat> Now, June Heath, now this is incredibly rare. <clears throat> the only place I have seen a June Heath is over in Dorset at Stuttman. So <clears throat> the rarest of all the successional stages, and this is because it's been lost to uh, development or plantations. And it can only occur on more acidic sandy areas, such as in Dorset. And this is because the rain there has leached out the lime from the sand, which in turn creates this acidic, sandy um, soil. But these dune heaths are important to very, uh, some very rare species of heather, lichens, grasses, and birds such as Dartford, Dartford warblers can be found in these dune heaths. Okay. And then we have the last successional stage which is scrub and woodland. So actually some scrub and woodland contributes towards this sort of overall mosaic of habitats and they are important for shelter and for wintering sites for birds and for invertebrates and actually they're a really good uh, source of nectar so 
sort of catkins, for example, are important for early spring bees and moths um, and other gene insects. So a small amount of native scrub species actually does add to the overall health of sand dunes. <clears throat> But we know that there are lots and lots of threats to the sand dune system. As I said earlier, they are now classified as the um, habitat most at risk now in Europe. And as I mentioned earlier, this is due to overstabilization and the wrong management. So we thought that dunes should be stabilized and we should put fences up and people should stay out and we should protect them from disturbance. And the dunes were no longer able to be dynamic and this has put species at risk. So you can see from Sutherland and Dorset <clears throat> the, the clear difference from 1936 and then the last picture that was taken in 2014 of the same area <laughs> of the sand dunes. It's completely different. Um, so it just kind of really hits home when you look at that, um, just what this overstabilization of sand dunes has actually done to the sand dune habitat and to the wildlife that relies on it. And we've also got this massive problem with invasive species. So it is a huge problem that we're facing. And invasive species are sort of when these non-native species have ended up on the sand dune system and they've flourished very quickly and they've overwhelmed the sand dune specialists. So um, this picture here is actually of Rose Rugosa or Japanese rose it's known of. It's actually a very beautiful plant. Um, it's non-native species and it was introduced to the UK as an ornamental species. <clears throat> very, very popular in back gardens. And you can see why it's very, very pretty. Um, but unfortunately it spreads widely across coastal areas and sand dunes. And it is out competing native plant species. We've also got a real problem, a real problem, especially at Braunton Burrows with the invasion of sea buckthorn. Um, so this is absolutely covered parts of the dunes in this thicket of spiny scrub and with this has come a complete loss of biodiversity and all of this plant growth means that the sand is becoming enriched with nutrients. Now in those embryo stages and those semi-fixed dune stages this is a massive problem because these invasive species are able to put down lots of roots as well so they're over-stabilizing the sand dunes as well as putting lots of nutrients into the ground. Now sand dune specialists can't, cannot cope with lots of nutrients being in the ground. So we've got high levels of nutrients. Um, sand dune loving species just cannot tolerate the high levels of nutrients. <clears throat> but there is some really, really good news. <laughs> So the Dunescapes project is here. It has identified that sand dunes need help and they need interventions. And it is diverse, the project. Each site is very, very different and has very specific requirements. So we are targeting some of the most important dune systems. And we're working very closely with local communities as well to help restore and support these gene systems for the future. So what are we actually doing? So across some of our sites, so nine key dune sites in England and Wales, we are actually carrying out habitat restoration. And this will cover about 7,000 hectares. And as I said, the, the work plan to each site is slightly different because of the new unique uh, aspects of each sand dune system and the needs. So we need different care packages for each sand dune system. In North Devon, there is habitat restoration taking place at Braunton Burrows. 
So one of the things that's happening is this removal of in invasive species, predominantly C. buckthorn. So this work actually started in September and it will be ongoing over the winter months to remove as much of the C. buckthorn as possible. And this work is being led by a specialised site lead. His name's Rupert Hawley. Some of you may know him. He's been working on Braunton Burrows for about 10 years as an ecologist. And so he is managing the restoration works that are going to be taking place. Uh, at other sites, we also need areas uh, to be scraped. So this, uh, what this involves is removing a layer of that rich organic material that is covering the sand. And then some sites will benefit from more extensive rejuvenation techniques. So not just being creative. So um, you can see here the creation of these dune slacks and ponds and notches. And this is really, really important. Um, so these will be created using tractors. And all of these techniques have the aim of creating more air sands to allow the dune wildlife to flourish. Okay. Another technique that we are using is grazing. So a lack of grazing and natural grazes has also accelerated a loss of dune habitats and has impacted on species such as the silver studded blue butterfly and fen orchid really benefit from grazing. At Woolakin Sand Dunes, the National Trust, in conjunction with a tenant farmer, introduced this kind of new pioneering invisible fencing system. So, this was introduced about three years ago now on Woolakin Sand Dunes. And what they've done is they've introduced these lovely North Devon red cattle, ruby red cattle they're called, and these ruby red cattle you can see all have these collars and within these collars, these collars um, will emit a signal so if, so we, what we've done is we buried cables under the sand dunes so you can't see them and these cables, if these cows approach those cables, it will emit a little shock here, which tells the cow not to go any further. So the cows, <laughs> it's really clever, but these cows weren't just put out there and expected to know what that means. They were trained for a long time before they went onto the gene system. So this is a really clever way of being able to have these beautiful grazing essential animals on the sand dunes without physically putting up fences. Now grazing is really really important. So the cows they they are very curious creatures. They will move around the sand dunes, they will break down the dense scrub um, and they will get inside that dense scrub and they'll move around and they will create areas of their sand and their ground for us. Um, and as they're walking, they're disturbing the ground and creating this and um, breaking down the scrub. So they're just fantastic. And this is something that humans wouldn't be able to do um, in the same amount of time that grazing animals can. So for us to mechanically go in there and remove their uh, remove the scrub um, as successfully as these grazing animals can do just couldn't happen. So these are really important for managing our sand dune systems. And on Wollakeem sand dunes, there is an area that the ranger who manages uh, Wollakeem, Josh, was, was showing me that there's actually just um, low vegetation. And he was explaining that just three years before, that was scrub, that was up to my shoulders. And that's no longer there because of the cows grazing in just three years. So. They're really, really fantastic. Really, really fantastic. And we've also got engagement officers. <laughs> so this is my engagement team. So we are spread across the UK and Wales. So over in Wales, we have David here. 
And all of us sit within different host organisations. And the idea of this is that we're sharing knowledge amongst ourselves and amongst these organisations. So it's really valuable um, that we are gaining expertise from each of these organisations. So David here, he's got a huge area that he covers in Wales. Um, all along the west coast and parts of North Wales. And we've got Natalie's on the Sefton coast. Andy, he's down in Cornwall. Julia, she's over at Studland in Dorset. Tish at the Lincolnshire coast. Me here in North Devon. And Eve in Cumbria. And then we are all managed by Tim. So he is our engagement manager. But what are we all doing then? So, in North Devon, it's been very, very busy. As Paul already said, I started in March. And about three weeks after I started, we went into lockdown. <laughs> so we've had to really think about how we can deliver education and engagement during this very surreal time. And I have to say it's been interesting, but it's been great. And we have already started to build and develop lots and lots of wonderful relationships with even with schools and colleges and universities, as well as community groups, including youth groups. Um, and what we're doing is developing and have developed some absolutely fantastic educational material and teaching sessions and we've had to move this to online so we've had to deliver teaching and training sessions to teachers and parents online so that they have the skills to then go and deliver these teaching sessions so under non-covid um in a non-covid world we would be bringing uh, these school groups, these colleges, these universities to the site. And for those that weren't able to get to the sites, we can go into them. But of course we can't do that. So we've had to think about how can we do that? So that was one way um, that we've managed to sort of adapt. So we've adapted these to be online sessions and we're developing these all of the time. Also uh, in North Devon, we have four 12 month placements. And some of you may recognize this gentleman here. So this is Fraser. So Fraser has volunteered for the National Trust in North Devon. And he's now come on board as one of the 12 month placements. So an immersive volunteer effectively. And this is amazing because he's brought with him a whole wealth of knowledge and I can see him developing and growing as well. So as he's learning new skills. Uh, so he's been absolutely wonderful. And he's been helping and supporting me. And during the summer, we were able to run some uh, outdoor sessions, which was fantastic. Um, and yeah, it's brilliant watching Fraser grow and develop. And I um, even managed to persuade him to do some filming. So he was adamant he was not going to do any filming, um, but he's a brilliant speaker. And me and his partner managed to force him into it. And uh, he's just sent me these videos that he's been filming about the successional stages of the sand dunes. And they're incredible. So they'll be going on um, the Dunescape website, on social media. I don't think he'll even look at them, um, but it's great. And it's great to see him be so passionate about sand dune species. He's really, really wonderful. So we also have three more of these 12 month placements available. We also have 10 one month placements as well, uh, which is really, really exciting. So this can be anybody who just wants to get experience whether it's because it's part of an, an academic course or just because they want to get experience um, we can facilitate that as well the other exciting thing we're doing is facilitating something called the john muir environment award 
So the civil environment awards is open to everybody and you don't need to be a wildlife expert to take part in it. And I really, really love this. So we have designed uh, a series of activities and actions for people to do um, that are based around the sand dunes and they complete these sort of tasks and then they're able to get this environment award, this certificate. So we are facilitating and aiding people to be able to achieve that certificate. So that's really, really great. We've also got those research projects that I was talking about earlier. So the small blue butterfly research project, the sand lizard research project, and we've also built connections with Reading University. So there are two lecturers at Reading University that are really interested in the nutritional benefits of the grazing and also the effects the grazing can have on the wildlife and the abundance of wildlife. So they are in the process of putting together um, research proposals for some of their university students. So that's really exciting that we're going to have working closely with an, another academic institution. And that's a brand new relationship that has come from this project. We're also doing a lot of wildlife monitoring and surveying. So these butterflies and plants. So we have um, already trained up some new volunteers to undertake this wildlife surveying and monitoring. And this links into something called a citizen science project that we are also running within the project. So with the work that's happening at Thornton Burrows, we need to know whether it's effective or not. We need a way of monitoring the effects of it. And one of the ways that we're doing that is through an app. So it's a dynamic Dunescapes app that you can download to your phone. And as you're walking around the dunes, you can record the species that you see onto this phone, onto this app, and that will get sent through a central database. So we are able to look at this data that's being collected and see the changes that are happening at Thornton Burrows. So we can identify and record these changes. We've also, of course, are undertaking this habitat management. So over the winter, we were going to be running work parties to help us start removing some of this scrub. Um, we did have our first one scheduled for next week. Of course, that's not going to be happening now. So we just have to wait and see and undertake that in line with government guidelines. So we've got lots of people that are interested in getting in there, getting their hands dirty <coughs> and wanting to physically um, be part of this habitat management as well, which is great. And then we've got a whole range of events. So again, and in non-COVID times, we would be running lots of guided walks and talks. So anything, we, we actually had stargazing and star photography um, lined up. Um, lots of events such as making bug homes and self-guided nature trails. Um, so we're also looking into the possibility of geocaching on the genes. So this is a really popular activity. So that might be something that we introduce to the genes as well. And one thing that we are looking into a lot at the moment is working with the local dog walking community um, to encourage, um, I guess, more reasonable, sensible actions around dogs walking and the effects of dogs on the genes. So here, here is a list of some of the things that we are doing. If you do want to get involved with any of these, you can contact me. You can send me an email um, at beverly.phillip at nationaltrust.org. Um, you can visit our website, have a look at our website. It's a beautiful website. It's just dynamicgenescapes.co.uk. So this is in ways that you can get involved in the project. Or if you know anyone that you think would be interested or would benefit from any of the um, things that I've talked about, the John Muir Award or the research projects or the placements or just coming along on any of our work parties, 
Um, if you're interested in coming along to any of the walks and talks that we will be organising on the June, just get in contact with me. So you can email me, uh, email me at beverly.phillips at nationaltrust.org. Uh, and also visit the website as well um, at dynamicgenescapes.co.uk. It's a beautiful website. Thank you. That was brilliant, Bev. <laughs> that was so good. Thank you very much. Really Aww. comprehensive. I just wish we had you on the marine Aww. environment. That would be so cool. <laughs> but, um, I don't want too many of us to get totally excited with the dunes, and I think they might after that.